This is the last grand rounds of the year, so thank you to Dr. Abrahamian and to Rani for a, a fantastic year. <clears throat> um, today we have Dr. Abdul Ali Abdelatef um, with us today. He is a adjunct assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, so he's coming to us from Houston, Texas. Um, he actually completed both his internal medicine uh, residency and nephrology fellowship here at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And I heard yesterday that they had a term of endearment for you. It was triple A. Um, so I, I, you know, when, when people were asking me who's coming and they were like, oh, it's triple A. So um, welcome back to sort of uh, familiar territory. Um, today he's going to be sharing with us a, a talk on ACTHAR, which is um, ACTH, and, and this is a, a therapeutic um, uh, agent that we used in one of our transplant patients this past year um, who had a living unrelated renal transplant from his wife, uh, had chronic kidney disease from FSGS, and had a very rapid and severe recurrence of that FSGS in the transplanted kidney. Um, we were trying to throw a, a numerous uh, number of, of modalities at him to try to treat the recurrent FSGS. And it seemed like he really did end up responding to the ACVAR. Um, thankfully, his, his urine protein dropped from 18 grams down to 3 grams. His creatinine is stable at 1.3. So it, it really has uh, proven beneficial, not in a complete remission, but definitely in a partial remission. So he's going to be sharing with us the role of ACVAR um, for some of our glomerulonephritis uh, uh, diseases. So Thank you. Come. Thank you, Angelina. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'll stand on this side for you. <laughs> so actually, the slide deck is very long slide deck. And I chose to actually borrow the slides from the pharmaceutical company itself because of the history of how ACTAR or ACTH came back to live in the United States. Now, this medication actually was approved in the United States in 1950. It was one of the, the first drug before steroids that was used to treat nephrotic syndrome in kids, OK? So uh, nephrotic syndrome, I'm going to just give a quick overview. I know we're a diverse group here. So if I'm too slow, uh, please ask me uh, to expedite or slow down on some of the slides. But just in general, when we have a patient with nephrotic syndrome, it's defined by a specific criteria. And this criteria depends on how much protein they lose through the kidney if they have other uh, presenting symptoms of edema or they have hypoalbuminemia, anytime a patient loses protein through the kidney, their albumin drops in the blood, then their lipid panel kind of become deranged. Now, we, defined, uh, no, we define normal proteinuria as less than 150 milligrams uh, per day. And anytime you have a patient that starts to have higher than that, that's when we start to work up the patient. And I'll show you in a little bit how we do that. Now, there's many different causes of nephrotic syndrome. The main ones is if it's a primary form, like minimal change disease, FSGS, like uh, Dr. Edwards' patient, uh, IgA, the most common worldwide. Minimal change disease you see a lot in kids, and it peaks again in adulthood. Uh, MPGN associated with different viruses, uh, as well as de novo. And you have very rare conditions like fibrillary GN and C1. Uh, Q nephropathy. Uh, when we look at the kidney, uh, we actually have what we call glomeruli. Now, each kidney has approximately 600 to 1 million of those glomeruli. And if you take one of those glomeruli and look at it actually under electron microscope, you see that's the podocyte. Now, the podocyte that uh, surrounds the capillaries in the kidney has multiple functions. Uh, one of them is basically uh, synthesis and repair of the glomerular basement membrane, which I'll show you in details in a little bit. Immunological function component of the innate immune system. It also surveillance of the, the pathogens and abnormal proteins, as well as structural support for the capillaries, which is underneath the foot processes, and production of growth factors for other cell lines within uh, the kidney itself. Now, when we look at the glomeruli, this picture that I showed you looks like this. So basically, you have the blood comes in here, goes through those capillaries. Those are the podocytes. 
they surround the little capillaries in the kidney and they allow for specific things to pass through, usually the urine and toxins, and everything else gets resorbed and goes back into the bloodstream. Okay? Now, how does that work? Well, this is, go back to this picture, okay? This is the bloodstream and that's the urinary space. And just in a, and this model it shows that the blood comes through here, you have multiple barriers to prevent protein being lost through the kidney. First, you have the endothelial cells uh, into the capillaries. You have the glomerular basement membrane. Then you have other slit diaphragms in the, between the uh, podocyte uh, foot processes. And you have all these little foot processes that prevent things from passing through to the urinary space. Anything that goes in here, we usually reabsorb it unless if there's a damage or inability of the kidney to do that. And one of those things is protein. So this is just a recap what happened when a patient becomes nephrotic. You have the damage to the podocyte, so you have destruction to the barrier of protein passing through. And when the blood comes through, the, urine, uh, the, blood, the protein passes through the bloodstream to the urinary space, and it's lost and it's not reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Now, when a patient actually present with nephrotic syndrome, they may present completely asymptomatic, okay? A patient may have no symptoms except someone detects some protein in the urine. And we do that always, you know, in transplant patients, part of the work, I mean, the routine labs is urine because we look for protein in the urine as an early indication of some damage happening to the kidney. But a patient may present with edema, weight gain from fluid retention, fatigue, ascites, foamy urine. Sometimes that's one of the only presenting symptoms. A patient comes in and says, foamy urine and they don't know why, we work them up, we find out they have nephrotic syndrome. Other manifestations, actually the patient may lose some proteins, uh, uh, become anemic, malnourished, thromboembolism. I had a patient with minimal change disease presented to the hospital with a splenic infarct. So that's the only reason he came to the hospital, a thrombosis in his spleen. And when we worked him up, it was minimal change disease. So we do see some of these patients present with different manifestations. Now, when we work up a patient to find out what disease state they have, it's usually a step-wise uh, process. We make sure that if a patient presents with significant proteinuria, you wanna make sure they don't have any underlying disease to cause secondary type of nephrotic syndrome. If we rule that out, then we look for a primary form of nephrotic syndrome, and that only can be diagnosed by kidney biopsy. If a patient is, uh, when we biopsy the kidney, basically uh, we do light microscopy, we do immunofluorescence and electron microscopy to look all the way down to the basement membrane because sometimes everything is negative till we get to this point and the only thing we see is, for example, minimal change disease damage to the barrier that allows, pre prevent the protein from leaking through the urinary space. Now, why do we care? So Dr. Edwards mentioned that when she treated this transplant patient, post-transplant recurrent FSGS, she said that we decreased the proteinuria to a significant low number, not completely normal, but we know in nephrology, and this is from a Canadian group, that if we treat any glomerular disease with any medication, independent of what kind of medication, what you threw at the patient, as long as you can decrease the proteinuria, you can slow down the disease process. So if you look at minimal, uh, idiopathic membranous patients followed for 15 years, it doesn't matter what we treated those patients with. If you establish a full remission in that patient, their renal survival is excellent. If you have partial remission, it's still the renal survival is significantly better than patients who are not responding uh, to the therapy. Same thing if you take FSGS patients, which is the enemy of nephrologists, because even if you get, I mean, if you treat a patient to a full remission, you still see about 20% of those patients will end up on dialysis at the end of the day, okay? So in FSGS as well, it doesn't matter what you treat the patient with. If you're able to slow down the disease process, you buy the patient time off the dialysis machine or needing to be retransplanted, for example. So partial remission or full remission is good for the patient. Now, why do we present this data? Because when, I'm on a, when I talk about this new medication that uh, I'm gonna present is actually, if you try to treat these patients with everything we have, and we don't have too many drugs, by the way, in the field of nephrology to treat glomerular diseases, maybe like you know less than 10, but a, a new agent that now we use 
to treat some of those patients. It can be used de novo or refractory, which I'll go through that in detail. Now, in 1989, we know that if you give steroids to patients with idiopathic membranous nephropathy, actually there was no difference, similar rates of complete or partial remission uh, in proteinuria compared to placebo. Okay? So there was no difference when you gave steroids. And why we present this information? Because this is what really differentiates this medication from steroids. And I'm going to explain exactly the mechanism of action in a little bit. But I just want you to remember this slide, that if you gave only steroids to a patient with nephrotic syndrome from idiopathic membranous nephropathy, there was no difference in remission in these patients compared to placebo. So we have very limited number of medications available to treat patients with glomerular diseases. And I'm going to present to you a new agent. So now ACTH, it's uh, a naturally occurring hormone that uh, in the body. And I'll show you the pathway of how is it produced. But what I want to show you is actually in 1950 and 1960, it was approved in the United States to treat patients with childhood nephrotic syndrome. And what they saw on these patients is that they went in full remission. Now, this is, came about before steroids came about. So after steroids came about, this has kind of faded away a little bit for some uh, 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 few years. Now, where does the ACTH come from? Well, it's produced in the pituitary gland, but you have the corticotropin uh, releasing hormone that acts on the pituitary gland, enhances that gland to produce ACTH, okay? Now, ACTH, when it binds to its MC1, uh, MC2 receptor in the adrenal cortex, it causes a production of steroids. And that's how this hormone acts on the body. So that's the common pathway that we're all familiar with when we look at ACTH and its effect on the body when it's produced by the pituitary gland. However, <coughs> There we go. Let's see. Huh? I don't know why it went off. Dunk. Was it just another slide, or did you have a video going on? Uh, it's supposed to move on to another slide. I don't have a mouse. Mm -mm. Technical difficulties here. gives you a little time to ask questions. <laughs> Any questions so far? <laughs> so have you guys used this new medication, Akthar, other than our Dr. Edwards? Is this the first time you guys use it in the center? Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, actually, we have all the data here in a little bit. <laughs> we still have time. I can run through this very fast when we get back on. But we have we have used it. Same thing. I mean, with the recurrent FSGS and transplant. I had a patient. Same thing. Is actually his mother gave him his kidney, uh, and we had the patient. I mean, we had recurrent of FSGS. We gave him rituxan, IVIG, plasmapheresis. Uh, He's sure on Prograf, Celsep, prednisone. So he basically he broke through all these medications. Then we gave the patient Axar, and he responded. Okay, he responded about at least 50% reduction in proteinuria, as well as stabilized his creatinine. For the past two years, we've been following the patient has not progressed anymore. And uh, the course of therapy, which I'll show you in a little bit, we usually treat these patients for six months at least. And then at the end of the six months, we recommend that we you taper them a little bit because they may be, uh, become adrenal insufficient if you just drop the dose, quick, just like giving higher dose steroids. But the difference is what we saw actually when you give this medication versus steroids in the kidney itself, which I'll show you in a little bit, but in the kidney, we found the receptors that ACTH act on in the kidney completely different from the receptor on the adrenal gland, okay? So ACTH have five different receptors in the body, AC, uh, melanocortin receptor one all the way to five, and it acts in different parts of the body, brain, liver, kidney, okay, immune system, and each organ has a different effect when this medication or with this hormone binds to their receptors. So when it binds to the kidney, actually, it binds to uh, receptors in, on the podocyte itself, on the endothelial cells, on the capillary cells, on the mesangial cells. So it has an effect on different parts within the kidney. And we think that the mechanism of action is actually through the NF-kappa pathway and prevents the inflammatory mediation of those cells uh, into the kidney to protect the podocyte from being damaged. Um, and the data that actually we have on the slide deck is we went through patients uh, with membranous nephropathy, we looked at patients with FSGS, we looked at patients with uh, minimal change disease, MPGN, IgA, we had patients with different patient groups had different response to the medication, but most of the patients that we have in the clinical trials have been exposed to other agents. At least on average, 2.2 different immunosuppressive agents were given to those patients before we actually gave them Actar. Okay. Now, when we talk about this medication in the United States, it's Actar. In Europe, it's ACTH. So ACTH, the one you order when you do a cortisol stem test, that's the synthetic form of ACTH. This is Actar is actually a highly purified uh, form of the hormone itself. And uh, there we go. We're back live. Here, I'll bring, uh, you yeah. tell me where in this, uh, actually. Actually, you want to go just to the slide deck and let's go down. So we just skip, see if there's a dead slide there. Okay, let's start. Actually, here, let's start on this slide. It's fine. Which number? Uh, this one that? Uh, 31. 31. Okay. Cross your fingers. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Everton. So basically, the hormone itself in the body, it's a pro-hormone. So you have pro opium melanocortin hormone producing the pituitary gland, then basically gets chopped up, different amino acids are clipped off, then you have ACTH, and you also have uh, melanocyte-stimulating hormone. And because of the cross-reaction, sometimes rare, we see hyperpigmentation when you treat this, uh, these patients, but I'll show you there was only just a couple of them and it's reversible, okay? So what happened, what I just was telling you when we didn't have the slide up, that this hormone, when it binds in the body to different receptors, when it binds to the adrenal gland, it binds to its receptor 2, melanocortin receptor 2, and that's when you get the steroidogenic effect of the hormone in the body. However, if it binds to the immune system, it has different receptors, it has different effect on the immune system, just like you would see in addition to the steroidal effect on the immune system. If it binds to the kidney, you have 
basically the MC1, um, MC1 and MC4 receptors are found on the podocytes tubular cells. Then you have the brain and the, kid, uh, and the uh, liver, but we'll focus just on the kidney for this talk. Okay. So just again to remind you that this this is the uh, uh, original pathway when ACTH acts on the adrenal gland, it binds to MC2 receptor, and that causes the corticosterone, cortisol, aldosterone production. That's how you have steroidogenic effect. However, when you look into the kidney and you look at MC2 receptor, which is found on the adrenal gland, is actually not found in the kidney. So we have MC1 receptor and we have MC4 receptor for ACTH to bind to, and it's found in different parts of the kidney, the podocyte, glomerular epithelial cells, mesangial cells, as well as tuber epithelial cells. So the mechanism of action, what I explained earlier, is you have the NF-kappa pathway, you have an inhibitor that binds to an NF-kappa protein. If this inhibitor disassociates from the, this protein, translocates into the nucleus, causes inflammation. What does ACTH does? It binds to it, prevents the disassociation of this complex, prevents inflammatory mediation within the inflammatory cells. Okay. So, Actar is actually indicated for diuresis and remission of proteinuria. Now, when people see this term, they say, why diuresis? Well, actually, because it was approved in 1950, okay? And when they treated these young kids with nephrotic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome went away, they auto-diuresed, okay? Because the kidney now uh, improved. So that's where the term came from. But basically, it's just treatment of proteinuria. Um, anytime you give any immunosuppression, just like we do in transplant, you don't give it to someone who is at risk for more uh, complications. If they have a fungal infection, if they have herpes in the eyes, if they have uh, TB, those are the patients you do not immunosuppress. If you have a patient with decompensated heart failure, uncontrolled hypertension, and you give them anything that causes salt and water retention, that's contraindicated till you control those disease states. Okay. But what we're going to go through is actually the experience that we have in the United States. And you can see here we have approximately four different clinical trials. Some of them just focus on uh, idiopathic membranous, and we see that actually last week I had a, a, a patient in transplant recurrent membranous nephropathy, and I just ordered ACTH because I'll show you the data. It's the best in actually minim membranous nephropathy. And then we have FSGS and other diseases that causes nephrotic syndrome. So, when they do these clinical trials, it's very important to know what was the definition of complete remission, partial remission, or limited response, okay, in these clinical trials. So if a patient is treated with any medication and they basically have a proteinuria reduction to less than half a gram, that's considered complete remission, okay? If a, if a patient has more than 50% reduction means they have 20 grams, but they went down to nine, still more than 50% reduction, that's still good, that's partial remission, as well as make, uh, their, uh, uh, I mean, uh, their uh, ratio, we usually monitor much simpler than collecting 24 hour urine, uh, goes down. Now, limited response, okay, the patient can have more than 50% reduction in protein, but if the creatinine does not improve or became worse during a clinical trial, that was considered a limited response. Now that I showed you earlier, those uh, two trials or two databases on membranous and FSGS, they followed the patient for 15 years. They did not look at just the creatinine, but if you have reduction in proteinuria independent of how you get that protein down, okay, that slows down disease process in the kidneys. That's why we give ACE inhibitors, ARBs to every patient with any type of kidney disease, okay. So let's look at a couple of those clinical trials. Now in 2012, we have a prospective open label 15 patient trial using ACTAR. Now that means there is no control, okay? We only have very small numbers. We're not like the cardiology field. We don't have 10,000, 15,000 patient populations. It's very hard to get FSGS patients in a clinical trial. But they had five patients with uh, membranous, five patients with FSGS, five patients uh, with uh, IgA. And then the study was done basically at Columbia. And what they did, they looked at different parameters to see how the patient responded to this medication. To go back here, 
how they dose the medication. Now, most of the time, you're going to see the medication dose as 80 units subcutaneous or intramuscular twice a week. However, you start low if you want to start with a low dose, 40 units for a couple of weeks to make sure the patient tolerates the medication, just like you give steroids, and then you jump the dose. Now, these guys look, uh, treated the patients for 24 weeks, six months, but I'm going to show in different clinical trials, they went a little bit uh, less, maybe four months. But uh, patient population, basically they define all 15 patients. You have five of them here, five FSGS, MCD and then you have five membranes. But what I want to actually show you is this, okay? Only two patients they chose in this clinical trial that they did not get exposed to something else. For example, that recurrent FSGS before transplant were exposed to like five different medications. They decided, okay, we tried everything on this disease and they broke through, let's just go ahead and try ACTAR. Versus other patient population, they were tried either on three, four, or two drugs. But on average, these patients in this clinical trial were already given at least two immunosuppressive agents before they were given ACTAR. Everyone else, you know, was on ACE inhibitors, ARBs. IgA patients, we usually really just give them ACE inhibitors, ARBs, unless if they have significant proteinuria. So what they saw out of those 15 patients that two with minimal change disease had uh, experienced remission, okay, two with FSGS minimal change and two IgA. So the primary outcome for patients with IgA was percent reduction because they did not wait till these patients were significantly nephrotic because sometimes you miss the boat with IgA patients, but they went ahead and treated these patients and saw some reduction. Now, anytime you give a patient medication, like you mentioned, you give cyclosporin and you give the patient Actar on your patient, but we usually don't use just one medication. Everyone is on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, if there's no contraindication. But, you know, the addition of Actar to these patients probably contributed. But just to show you how the patients responded to the medication, you had a couple of patients from the idiopathic membranous that responded. And remember, these patients, at least on average, had a couple of immunosuppressant therapies given to them and they failed. So if you have two patients that responded that may have not responded to other agents, that's, you know, to us, that's a good response for these patients. Uh, the patients, uh, basically, the other patients did not have a response. Some of them progressed through the therapy. Now, when you look at the FSGS minimal change disease patients, uh, same thing, okay? You have a couple of patients that responded to the medication, and then you have other patients that did not respond to the medication. We do not expect everyone that you give them the medication to respond, but we give patients a chance with this new medication. Same thing with IgA. We had three patients that had respond to the medication, reduction in their proteinuria, actually four of them, that has some reduction in proteinuria. This patient did not have a significant reduction. But um, side effect profile, just like you give steroids. If you look at the side effect profile, glucose control problems, okay, increase in skin pigmentation because of the uh, cross uh, reaction on the receptor I showed earlier. But most of the time, they're steroidogenic. But if you take a patient with disease state like this, and you actually give them one milligram uh, per kilogram, which is 60 to 80 grams of prednisone every day for six months, you will probably have a lot of side effect profile on this side. So actually, the fact that you have only this many out of the 15 patients shows that actually less steroidogenic side effect profile with this medication, but it still can happen. And each patient is an individual patient. Someone may have a severe reaction to a medication. Someone may not uh, respond to it. We do not claim this medication basically going to do everything. Why? Because very small numbers, okay? Some of them retrospective, some of them prospective. So the most recent trial actually looked at membranous nephropathy, and this was published uh, uh, last year, and what they did in this, <laughs> let me try to go back, let's see if I do it manual, maybe a little more. It's not. But I can tell you what happened with these guys. <laughs> okay. 
So basically, what the, this is was done at two academic center, uh, centers, basically in uh, uh, Columbia and Stanford. And what they did, they allowed each uh, academic center to choose their way of treating their patients. So uh, in Stanford, uh, Stanford, they decided they want to start slow and stay on a low dose. So they said, okay, we're going to give 40 units, not 80, 40 units for the first four weeks. Then we're going to give them once a week. Then we're going to give them 40 twice a week. Okay. And they follow these patients out of their uh, 10 patients. I mean, 12 patients, five of them did not respond. So they crossed them into the uh, Columbia group, which is a higher dose. So the Columbia group said, okay, we're going to give 40 for uh, once a week for a couple of weeks. Then we're going to jump the dose to 80. So they actually gave a higher dose. And what they showed at the end that the patient that received the higher dose, Total cumulative dose means was approximately 2,800 units for the entire period of the clinical trial. Those patients had significantly better response than the patients who were given the lower dose. The other thing they showed is when you actually treat these patients, we treat them to six months. At six months, this, they showed approximately three gram uh, reduction in proteinuria, but when they followed the patient for a full year after that, there was still continued reduction in proteinuria. So even though you stop treatment at six months, that doesn't mean that effect. Just like you give cytoxin to a patient with lupus. We treat for six months, then we hope that they go in full remission eventually. Same thing with this medication. Then the, the another group looked at actually just FSGS patients. And when they looked at the FSGS patients, same thing. These were different centers. Each one of them had different way of dosing the medication. There was like, I would say, one third of the patients with FSGS had responded to the medication versus the ones who were not treated or treated with other agents. If you look at all those clinical trials that I, uh, I will show you or I showed you some of them, most of those patients were exposed at least to a couple of immunosuppressive agents before they're given the medication. Side effect profile in all the patient population were a steroidogenic side effect profile. There was really no difference in, in side effect profile than what you would see in steroids. Now, this medication is actually have approximately 50 indications in the NSC. It's not just used in the field of nephrology. Rheumatologists use it for, you know, polymyositis. Uh, derma, uh, derm, uh, dermatological diseases. It's used in the field of, uh, I mean, uh, pulmonary. They use it for uh, uh, sarcoid, okay, in the lung. It's also used for uh, multiple sclerosis. It's used for infantile spasm. So it has many different indications in the United States. But the one we use for, I mean, the indication for kidney disease is not a specific disease state. It's not indicated only for, for example, for patients with chronic kidney disease. It so actually can be used across the board before transplant or after transplant. Any patient that has proteinuria, then this medication can be indicated. It does not have to be uh, a second line agent. It can be a first line agent. For example, this patient that just broke through uh, recurrent membranous, I know the patient was treated, failed, went on dialysis, had a transplant, now membranous is coming back. Before, and he's already basically on Prograf, Celsept, and Prednisone, so he's already breaking through three different medications, so just chose to give the patient and we'll see how we respond. But he had actually different centers that I went to, they report the same thing, results with recurrent FSGS, that they throw the kitchen sink at these patients, nothing happens, they try these medications, they see some response, okay. Yes. We have not tried that, but that's one of the things, uh, you know, if the patient, let's say, have proteinuria, okay, then it's something you can use. Because the mechanism of action, we don't know exactly. Uh, yes, it's through the nf kappa pathway, but it acts on the podocyte, it acts on the tuberal epithelial cells, mesangial cells, endothelial cells. So its effect in the body and the kidney, okay, is, is brought. So it could, okay, or we don't know, okay? We also, I mean, we don't recommend that it's used for rejection because we usually give steroids or time or whatever the patient's state, I mean, the grade of rejection is. But uh, in general, any patient that presents with any kind of uh, proteinuric state, nephrotic range is the indication, the approval, okay, this medication can be used there. All right. Any other questions?
Sure. Uh, the treatment in most of the clinical trials, okay, uh, the treatment was at least up to six months, okay. Uh, the indication of the medication, actually, it's approved to be given 40 to 80 units, subcutaneous or intramuscular, every 24 to 72 hours. So if you want to choose, if your patient, for example, very sensitive to uh, diabetic, let's say poorly controlled diabetic, and you want to do the 40, and you want to do it every other day instead of giving a whole, a big dose, 80, okay, twice a week, that's fine. So you're actually... At, the physician chooses what dose and what rate and how frequent. So you can start with 40 to 80 every day, every other day, or every third day, okay? You treat up to six months. At six months, previously we said you stop, you know, abrupt stop, but because there is the risk, okay? Not everyone will get adrenal insufficiency, but there is a risk for adrenal insufficiency. With those patients, you probably want to taper down. How I would taper down, I usually, if they're on 80, I cut them to 40. Okay, and then if they're on twice a week, I cut them down to uh, once a week, okay? And then you taper the patient off. Okay, there you go, we're back to, so uh, we actually, uh, that's what I told you, that these guys, okay, actually the Mayo Clinic and the Toronto group, some of them started slow, some of them started with the higher dose and they followed the patient. Now, in all those patients, we made sure, number one, there is no confounding factors, okay? We made sure that there has not been uh, I mean, their blood pressure has been controlled. We made sure they're maximized on their ARBs or ACE inhibitors to make sure that nothing is added during the clinical trial. And then when the patients were optimized on those therapies, blood pressure controlled, as well as their own ACE inhibitors, good controlled blood pressure, then they were exposed to the medication. And basically, this is what we showed. I'll just, since we looked at that, and the average proteinuria in these patients was approximately 9 grams, okay? And the albumin was 2.7, which indicates loss of protein in the urine. And what they saw, they saw 50%, okay, reduction at completion of the clinical trial. It means when they finished infusing ACTAR or given subcutaneous ACTAR, 50% reduction was already, uh, uh, they saw 50% reduction in proteinuria, but when they followed the patient after they finished treatment up to a year, the patient continued to still, few patients still uh, uh, improving. So there was 65% at one year follow-up, okay? So this is basically the data. And what I mentioned earlier, the dose response, this is the dose response. So the guys that gave the higher dose, for a longer period of time versus the ones that gave the lower dose, their total cumulative dose was 880 units versus those guys, okay, their total dose was approximately 2,800 units. So the higher the dose that was given through the clinical trial, the better the response to the medication. So if you have a membrane patient and you want to treat them, I would recommend that you go with the 80 units sub-Q. You can start with the 40 just to make sure the patient is uh, uh, tolerant, okay, because they basically may have same thing as you see. The other thing in membrane nephropathy, which I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you know we have this new marker that antiphospholipase A2 receptor. You can actually, it's a blood test that sometimes without even doing a kidney biopsy, if you order this test and it's positive and you suspect membranous, it's going to be membranous, okay? But it's not a protein that we follow as a response to treatment, but it just helps you to differentiate between idiopathic membranes or secondary membranes. As you know, someone may present with membranous uh, pre-cancerous uh, presentation as a paraneoplastic syndrome. That's the patient you don't want to give immunosuppressive therapy before you do colonoscopies, rule out any type of cancer. So this is kind of help differentiate between the two, okay? How do, when you give it, how does it peak? Actually, when you give the higher dose, okay, this is, it peaks and at 24 hours, ACTH goes down, okay, and you also see the effect with the higher dose. This is in the kidney, so the urine cortisol uh, level was higher when you give the higher dose versus the lower dose. And that's why we thought, we think that when you give the higher cumulative dose in these patients, there was more effect within the kidney on, uh, with ACTH. And let's see, I think we touched base on that. 
closing in. But it's okay. So the same, <laughs> don't worry about it. We only have, what, 10 minutes. But uh, the same thing happens with FSGS patients. You know, the same thing I showed you with membranous, same thing happened with FSGS patients. If you take IgA patients, also you have patients that will respond. Patients won't respond, okay, to the medication. The ones that actually had the least response were the MPGN patients. Those guys, out of the five patients, only one patient responded. Still, you know, maybe something, if they don't respond to other therapies, you can try. But in general, if it's, mem if it's nephrotic syndrome of any etiology, you can use this medication in those patients. Post-transplant, a lot of actually centers are now trying this medication. The reason is because we do everything and the patients, especially the FSGS patients, Okay, don't respond very well. Uh, for FSGS patients, not we don't have really much data in transplant yet. Okay, that something could be a pile. I mean, if you talk to those guys, you know, talk to Christy, you can actually try this on some of the patients. They actually sponsoring the company that Mellon Crot. They are sponsoring uh, investigator initiated clinical trials. So. It could be tried like, you know, with glomerulopathy, okay? Uh, uh, so it can happen. But in FSGS patients, I guess we tried everything. We tried to plasma for Easton before, even Rituxan before, after, they still can break through. But that, that one thing that can be tried as well. Yes? Uh, so we're um, Uh, not specifically, they did not look at that, but uh, I think if, if yeah, the, if the side effect profile when we look at the ACTH at the 80 units was less than you would expect with the 60 to 80 milligram of prednisone per day for patients. Mm -hmm. So these MS1 receptors can then activate other pathways apart from just prednisone steroids. Yeah, ex exactly, because what happened. <laughs> Definitely, because actually the, the receptor, the MC2 receptor found on the adrenal gland is completely absent in the kidney. So the receptors in the kidney, MC1 and MC4. So the nf kappa pathway. So what happened, ACTH inhibits the nf kappa pathway and decreases inflammatory mediation within the kidney in general. Mm -hmm. Yes? It seems like finding the Exactly. Yeah, and in membranous, the higher dose was better when with the FSGS patients when they looked if it was a dose relationship, there was no significant difference, okay, in the FSGS patients. In the membranous patients, there was more response with the higher dose because uh, uh, the, when they did the FSGS patient, there was no significant difference between the dose. But we, right now, we really don't know what's the highest dose, but the highest dose that has been used so far with this medication per week is 80 twice a week. So if someone wants to try a higher dose of the patient tolerate, we still don't know. Okay, yes. How long do you have to use it to be comfortable with that Six months. Just like we, you know, when we give cytoxin, for example, for a class four lupus, we say give six months and then stop and watch. So the recommendation, after three months, what happened with the, with the Mayo Clinic, the patients that they started them on a low dose with the 40 twice a week, at three months, at 90 days, there was no response, they jumped the dose, then the patients start to have response, okay? Versus the, uh, the Toronto group, they actually started after one month at the higher dose, okay? Yes? Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, for, for example, the F, I don't know how many, how many months, Angelina, you gave your patient? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what happened is at six months, if there was no response, and even if you see a little bit of protein reduction, it's okay to extend. There's, it's, there's no cutoff. I mean, as you, you actually decide when to stop. If you feel like, okay, I'm gonna give it for a year, okay, then it's okay. I mean, in kids, sometimes we give cytoxin for a year, not for six months sometimes, so you still have that choice. That, there's no limit to what you use, okay? You, you have to evaluate risks and benefits. You have an older patient with osteoporosis, 
for sure I don't want to give them too long of steroidogenic kind of medication. But uh, if it's a younger patient that has no complications from steroids and you want to push the dose, you know, up to a year, it's all your decision. So one of your earlier um, slides showing patient demographics, mm -hmm. I was a little surprised that the patients seem much older than I would have. Yeah, the, minim the membranous patients, which is the average we see, they were 50 to 65. The IgA patients were 30 to 50, okay? And the uh, minimal change disease patients, FSGS, were also in that kind of mid-age group. So what about the pediatric population that presents with FSGS, IgA? Is this been tried? It's approved for all kind of patients, okay? But it's, uh, it's been tried, uh, I mean, the, the clinical trials I showed you were all adults. In the past, this medication in the 50s, 60s was used only for kids and they responded. So we don't know if those kids back then had FSGS versus minimal change only, but that's how the medication got indication. So that doesn't mean an FSGS kid cannot be tried. Yes, they can. And you can probably with a kid, you might want to start with the low dose and see what happens. I think one of the things that we have to point out is the cost of this medication. It used to be $50 back in the 50s and 60s. And exactly. it's, now it's like $30,000 of vial. And so we're not going to just use this on every patient. Sure. It has to be, you know, a very well thought out, maybe, Definitely. you know, cost benefit. But I think it has to be pointed out that that's why we're not using this more. And hopefully if there are clinical trials that we can get involved in, that would be great. But we have to assure that there's funding or assistance. Uh, what happened in the 50s is was the synthetic acid. I mean, it was uh, actually it was the only thing available then. Extract. Now it's you know manufactured, FDA approved. <laughs> and it was a fast track FDA approval for those patients that can really benefit from it. And so the company can afford to charge that much. But it's really one of those drugs, kind of like Solaris, where we really have to make sure that it's a warranted use and benefit. I mean, just for example, the patient that with FSGS had 50 plasmapheresis, was given rotoxan, you know, so, I mean, if you look at the cost effectiveness, if a patient had 50 plasmapheresis sessions, I don't know how much is that in the hospital, that's right. Yeah, so versus, you know, but sometimes, you know, a dialysis patient, you know, I mean, we give them a transplant, it costs, what, 250000 to transplant a patient, maybe? So we say that's better than the $70,000 a year of dialysis, but still, yeah. Yes. Yes, any, any, any patient that has a systemic fungal infection, okay, TB, ocular herpes, okay, or malignancy, is contraindicated, okay? Any patient with decompensated heart failure because anytime you give steroids or something similar to steroids will cause fluid and salt retention so that a patient is contraindicated unless of their control, okay? So just like you would think of steroids, okay, well, when you won't give it, this medication, same way. Severe patient with severe osteoporosis, you know, we have young people who's been on steroids all their life, okay? They all have osteoporosis in their 20s. This is a patient that you don't give this medication to. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> hey, it's good, no problem. At least we get most of the stuff in. Do we That's have man. Wait, do we have M&M? <laughs> I think there's, isn't there M&M? I thought you were. You're on the list. You're having your stains? Yeah, yeah, I'm saying the weekend. <laughs> well, it's going to I put them uh, at the height resort next to the... Um, uh, oh, yeah, health country. It's good. So the kids are playing, swimming, sliding. What is that? Yes, yes. Oh, no. It's so there is one little area. So ironically, the picture is almost great. Yeah, the other. Uh,
Does it have anything else? You know, how many more concentration? Email? Um, no. I believe that we'll reach out to him again. Yeah, we'll reach out to him again. But yeah, any other things, wounded warrior stuff that you know going on there? Or? Yeah, I'd like to throw, I always like to throw in some thoughts that explain stuff. Sure, we'll pour you out. Okay. So you guys, how many trespass now it goes down? Um, can you guys pick up in combination with our liver recording volume? Okay. Um, and that's probably what will happen in the United Methodist Hospital. Oh, okay. But, uh, you know, they're still Methodist and questionable about what they do, but liver volume is going up, so everything's kind of, good, everything's good. Kind of picking up. They, uh, spread rumors that one of them, you know, they, they had two children on the list that they transferred to the prior <laughs> so, actually, I had one of my patients from a Houston. She matched and then came to Houston, transplanted it up because she was in the a swamp. Yeah, swamp. Yeah. So, so she we, up here. we do it here. We, we combined with them. And, um, basically, combined our swap list. We've had a few hits. Um, we've done quite a few interviews. We've actually, you must see the Fenonofi that they did that. We reached out to the other programs in the state and to try to do the statewide yeah. list. Haven't gotten much interest, but we're going to do it again. When we're going to get this histopath program, mm -hmm. one of those programs that you can kind of you plug in the patient and we're going to reach out again to try to develop a statewide pair consortium. Uh, because it's much easier if there's proximity to the transplant centers. You know, we've, we've done it from international, which logistically is a pain in the butt. So we're trying to, we have, and I don't know where we're talking about it, but uh, a statewide care consortium. Otherwise, yeah, not it's not right. going to Methodist. And, you know, and Methodist is such a black box. No one, look, no one can look into Methodist to see what's going on there. They know they're doing the right thing, but, you know, they're doing something right or wrong. They're the business living donor program in the country, so. Yeah, same in Houston. They're the busiest, you know. And uh, I think we're just in Houston. Uh, uh, never mind. Yeah. So, uh, 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 that's sorry. UT? No, uh, nothing. Uh, he's there. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Well, good to see you again. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hi there. My name is David. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. So, Ashburn Daily. This is a really great work with Dr. Ramani. Yes. I want to ask his name. Yeah, I'll be, I'm going to be doing this for you. Perfect. Yeah. Welcome to the room. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm very, very excited, Thank actually. You. But I still have Baylor College of Medicine right next to the PA. Well, it's the yeah, Baylor College of Medicine. Yeah, you don't write the Joe. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So, Ramanathan is Baylor. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I saw that. I saw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't realize no, that. Yeah, Baylor went to the whole DA. Just like if you want to be able to the hospital in the DA. Yeah. So I would love to, like in the future, if there's anything that you want to collaborate on, if there's anything that you need from a pharmacy perspective, please do that. Very excited about it. But um, yeah, I, I never 
Hey, you made it. Thank you so much again for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate it. It's very cute. Last night, I was sending Mary a text. Hey, listen, Emma, because people are going to see it that are on Facebook, and I don't want to see it. Yeah, No. No. Her response to Emma on Facebook, okay? I did not see that. Could have been the computer. She could have been. I, I asked her to do it because I was driving home yesterday and I said, I'm not going to be home over my computer for 40 minutes and get the word out to people. So I asked her, I said, would you do me a favor and post it? So, I know. And yeah. I don't see what I do with that. I know. Probably, probably do. Cannot deal with this today. Who wants her? Probably do. Especially after the, especially she, I sat next to her yesterday in the library and put my stuff down, and she came up and um, seen in that takes that area over there. She doesn't want to sit there when she leaves. She came over, she put her stuff down. Um, while I was out of the room, and um, so, so when I came back, they were like there she was, like right next to so, me. So I saw Doctor Doctor Rosenkrantz come in again yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, Oh, good. Again, I really liked her lecturing style yesterday. I liked her stories and how she gives personal right. analogy that right. to, to, it helps the stuff to stick. She goes, "You liked her?" She goes, "I hated her." She goes, "Well, you know what?" And, and I've already I've already complained to people about her lack of being able to present a case and her lack of being able to um, teach us about you know di you diagnostic wrong, right? diagnostic methods. And I looked at her and said, "You already complained." I said, "We have we've had the woman for two hours." And you've already complained to somebody. Mm -hmm. She just goes, "Yeah, that's not what that's not what we're here for." Why do they feel so entitled? I don't know. Like I would never like. You know, this is a privilege for you to be here. Why are you telling them that yeah. it's not good enough for you? Right. Why do you know it's not good enough right. for you? Right. Like, why are you telling them that this 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 is not important to you as a PA, as a primary care PA? You're, she's saying that this is not important to us. This is not this is not relevant to where we're going and to where to where. You know, Careers are. She's not teaching to us, and I complain about it. Like, and you don't oh, yeah. realize that that's what it is. Like, yeah. like fifty percent. Yeah. They say fifty percent yeah. of our complaints in primary care are going to be stomach problems, GI issues. I don't like her teaching style. I complained about it already. And I, I, what I should have said, it took me by surprise. What I should have said is, <laughs> I should have said, yeah, I'll bet you did. <laughs> that's what I, I know. It's always the that's what I was afterwards. Like, like that's what I. And then finally, I was like, you know, I really got so much. And she was still talking, and I just left. I was like, I don't. How can you do that? I know. Somebody, like, he was just, I'm so sorry, but when I talked to him, he 
issues is not going to go by this. Yeah. You can't. I mean, unless there are people that are doing more about the match. I am. Yeah. She wants to be the next show. She wants to be the one with the, she wants to be the highest, she wants to get the highest GPA in her class. And you get it by bullying people? Yeah. She wants to get the highest GPA in her, in her class. She had a post, this was many months ago, I think at the end of the first semester, mm -hmm. many months ago or something about, um, I don't know, she said something first at, well, at one point on uh, Facebook after we had a really bad, busy exam week in December, mm -hmm. I'm some, like, I'm baking cookies or I'm baking and I'm celebrating because I'm See my husband in 48 hours, and I just totally, totally rocked three of the hardest exams we've had this whole semester. So her mom gets on there, and her mom gets on there, and says, like, Great job, baby, I'm so proud of you. And he replies back, reading this book, he replies back, and says, Mama, I'm going to get the highest grade out of everybody. I'm going to make, I'm going to make you guys really, really proud. Like, that's not what it's about, Courtney. It's not. It's not. Because by doing this and striving for this, you're making yourself extremely annoying. And I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to lose you. Know, like ever. Ever. Yeah. I feel like it's yeah. something that's helping her. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah. 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 You know, I asked, I asked one of my friends once. That's why she's so good. When she's in pounds, too. Right. I asked one of